So I've been asked to speak about uh, presbyopia correction in the absence of cataract using presbyond laser blended vision. And I have a financial interest in that I'm, I've been a consultant for Carl Zeiss for 20 years. And actually I developed uh, presbyond, although I actually don't have a financial interest in presbyond. I, it was programmed by Zeiss, um, uh, but I don't. I, I, I've received no payment for that, and uh, if you use Presbyond, I don't get payment either. So, presbyopic correction has the, the 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 debate over the years has has been really thought of as this big existential battle between considering whether presbyopic correction should be done in the cornea or the lens, as if it's two completely different planets. Um, and arguing that the problem is that the lens isn't working anymore, so we need to do the surgery on the lens. Why punish the cornea for the sins of the lens? And rather than thinking of this as two planets, I would like to consider you, um, I would like you to consider that this is not a problem of two planets. I would like you to consider that this is a problem, in fact, of three planets. And those three planets are multifocality, extended depth of field by means of spherical aberration modulation, and monovision. So in other words, I want us to think about presbyopic correction in terms of these three modalities rather than in terms of cornea or lens. And the reason for this is that Multifocality, we often, th we actually think of diffractive IOLs or even bifocal diffractive IOLs, refractive IOLs, but actually multifocality has been around by inserting inlays into the cornea, by doing multifocal corneal ablations. And monovision has been obviously around for many years in cataract surgery with monofocal IOLs and has been used in LASIK for many, many years. In fact, many ophthalmologists have had monovision LASIK in their own eyes. What I want to show you is that the whole of the industry has actually converged on a different solution, which takes care of the biggest compromises of these two modalities. And that is the use of spherical aberration to increase the depth of field and produce with a small anasmotropia continuous vision from near to distance. And this is actually not monovision and it's not multifocality. It's actually a modification of binocular vision. Um, it's stereo vision. And I will point out later that in fact, the IOL industry has started to copy this principle, which um, I will take credit for uh, uh, working on very hard in the early 2000s. And I'll, I'll show you a bit about the history of this. So we think about the principle of multifocality. That means more than one focus in one eye. The original multifocal eye wells had two foci, a distance and a near foci. Uh, reduction in addition was then introduced so that we could have distance and intermediate vision. And then mix and match between distance and intermediate in one eye, distance and near in the other eye was introduced until finally we had IOLs that had trifocality or even quadrifocality in some cases. So three different focal distances. And if we look at the optics of these diffractive IOLs with um, super high resolution wavefront sensors like the Osiris from CSO, which 40, 41,000 points in a six millimeter zone, you can see how the refractive error is affected by these diffractive optics. And in fact, patients tell us about this. Here's a drawing of a white spot at the end of my office with the patient's best refraction in uh, looking through this symphony lens. And this is what she draws that she sees around traffic lights at night. So the problem with multifocality is that it comes with at a cost of uh, decreasing light transmission and therefore reduce contrast sensitivity. It's part of the way that these IOLs work. And I wanna address this in the sense that multifocality, although it's very clever, it is essentially demanding of the brain that it takes two images in the same eye 
and that it 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 it, requ it requires that the brain resolve one image from another inside the same eye. That is, if we like to call it intraocular rivalry. And that intraocular rivalry is not a natural process. It does take place and most, about two thirds of humans will adapt to multifocality, not everybody. And I wanna compare this to the monovision principle where we're relying on suppression. And this is quite a different requirement of the brain because here we're asking the brain to select one field of vision from one eye over another and there isn't essentially an intraocular rivalry, there's an interocular rivalry. And that process is entirely natural. In fact, everyone has the ability to suppress the vision from one eye. Successful monovision patient wearers, they don't perceive half the world, even though they're suppressing the vision from one eye. So the vision in, in, is really in the mind, not you know um, at, at the level of the retina. So let's consider our three planets and let's focus on this idea of multifocality and i'm going to use an example uh, that's less common and less commonly understood which is multifocal cornea surgery um, one of the manufacturers commercialized uh, some um, uh, ablation profiles developed by jorge alio and these were multifocal corneas where the center of the cornea had an add of 2.25 um, diopters and both eyes were targeted at minus 0.5 diopters. And the results were okay, uh, but patients did lose lines of best spectacle corrected vision because you know, putting a 2.25 2, 2 diopter ad in the center of the cornea uh, induces a lot of very high, high order aberrations. So these same investigators um, went ahead and decreased the ad to 175 in the center of each cornea, but now, because of the decreased ad in the eyes, they figured they had to introduce a little bit of myopia into the non-dominant eye. And this did improve the safety from 12% loss of two lines to 5%, but 5% is still too high. So they decreased the ad even further in the dominant eye. And using a little bit of myopia in the non-dominant eye with 175 ad, they reached a point where binocularly these patients were not losing uh, lines of best spectacle correction. So which much, much lower ad, and this is called their hybrid mode. Now, actually, they allow the surgeon to decrease the ad even further, and now you're starting to get into basically a change in spherical aberration of the cornea without really a central island of extra ad. So when we look at multifocality, what we're looking at is that there's a high chance that there are going to be night vision changes or disturbances, contrast reduction. There's a chance that there won't be good tolerance even after, after adaptation period, but there will probably be good near vision and good intermediate vision and good the distance vision once uh, adaptation has been achieved. Retreatment options, however, are limited because you've got a multifocal cornea and, and you know, uh, it's a complex surface. So let's move on to the monovision planet and discuss that. Well, we know that monovision is a procedure where one eye is set at distance and the other eye sit at near. And this signifies that the distance vision of the near eye is very blurry and the near vision of the distance eye is very blurry. It also means that intermediate vision is blurry. And so because of this disparity between the eyes, even the best um, tolerated studies of monovision show that only about two thirds of patients will tolerate the, the difference between the eyes required to get significant uh, near vision. So the challenges of monovision, as I said, intermediate vision loss, neural subtraction because of the um, cross blur from the distance eye, patients see better when they cover their near eye than when they uncover their near eye. Uh, and stereoacuity is, is affected if the monovision is greater than one and a half diopters. Of course, there's summation loss because the eyes are not working together. And there's all this question of two thirds of the patients being tolerant and one third not being tolerant. So 
how does monovision progress? Well, we decrease the difference between the eyes. Graham Barrett, for many years, was advocating that a, a modest monovision would improve on all of these disadvantages of monovision and produce you know, reasonable intermediate vision, although maybe not great near vision. And when we look at the um, Pardon study from 1990, where they looked at how much summation there was, this is the summation ratio of binocular vision um, versus the anisometropia between the eyes, we see that the graph crosses the line at 1.3 diopters, meaning that if there's a 1.3 diopter difference between the eyes, the distance vision of the distance eye set to Plano will be about one, uh, one point, about 110%. There's a little bit of addition from the blur eye to the distance vision, but that if you increase the difference between the eyes beyond that, you get the neural subtraction phase of the curve, and that once you reach three and a half diopters of difference between the eyes, the brain just has to suppress the vision completely in order not to, to uh, feel confusion. As I mentioned, anything more than one and a half or anything from one and a half diopters or more anisometropia, there is loss of stereoacuity. And so this modest monovision of minus one or minus 0.75, um, you know, maintains stereoacuity, improves tolerance and gives better intermediate vision. But of course, near vision is compromised. So in summary, Modest monovision has a moderate chance of affecting the night vision. Contrast is maintained because it's a refractive procedure. About two thirds of the patients tolerate it. The near vision is good if it's tolerated, but the intermediate is poor. And the distance vision is good on, as long as things are tolerated. And it's very easy to enhance if you're doing monovision LASIK. Of course, you might do modest monovision and switch between improved near or improved intermediate vision. So if we now move on to the modality, which I believe is becoming the common standard across all uh, corneal and lens options, uh, and which, you know, we started looking at this with spherical aberration in the early 2000s and is now this Presbyon product by Zeiss. I discovered that spherical aberration increases depth of field. I'll come to that in a minute. And the interesting thing about spherical aberration is that it is a natural, naturally occurring aberration. Spherical aberration increases with the eye with age. And actually, when we accommodate, the spherical aberration of the eye also goes up, affording increased depth of field and an advantage in terms of improving near vision. Um, it's natural to understand why that is, right? When, when the lens bunches up, it becomes more spherical. So there is more spherical aberration. And I want to be very clear, spherical aberration modulation of depth of field is not a multifocal ablation. Multifocality is more than one focus in the same eye. So we know that aspheric optics are designed to produce a perfect focus, but perfect focus means very little depth of field outside of the focus. And we know that spherical aberration sort of smears the focal point but affords depth of field. Now there's a very nice experiment here which I'm going to do on the screen and I'm going to show you watching this screen how you are able to filter spherical aberration. So what this has done here is to defocus um, these letters according to a spherical blur. And let's go to the 150 level of spherical blur, and you can see it's hardly possible to see any of the letters, even on the top line, maybe the O. When we take that minus 150 spherical blur and add spherical aberration to it, you can now, you watching this screen, looking at this screen, can now detect the edges of the letters much, much better, all the way down. And that is because the blur produced by spherical aberration of the edges of the letters is filtered by the brain, while the blur produced by spherical defocus is not. So the brain has spherical aberration filters, but not defocus filters. And so when we're considering what blended vision does, what Presbyon does, 
the brain is doing some filtering. So this isn't actually the vision that the brain is seeing. That might be the retinal image, but the brain is seeing this. And the spherical aberration of the distance eye is being filtered to sharp. So in fact, in Presbyond, it is the combination of these two images that the brain is fusing, explaining why we have much more tolerance, explaining why we still maintain stereoacuity. And that difference between the eyes is what you need to compare to what the difference would be if we were just doing monovision. And, you know, diagrammatically, that is obviously going to be much harder for the brain to fuse. Now, once we started talking about this in about 2004, 2005, a number of centers around the world that had adaptive optics um, machines and, and setups started testing our theory. And one of the, the publications by Carolina Rocha uh, was uh, using uh, the, the French adaptive optic, optic system, um, the Imaginize uh, system. And they showed that changing spherical aberration, increasing spherical aberration, led to an increase in depth of field. And that the, but what was you know, fascinating about this was that it was a positive change in spherical aberration or a negative change in spherical aberration. So independent of pupil size, right? The pupil size was in the same in, in, in all these conditions. So the change in spherical aberration alone was increasing the depth of field of the eye. And this wasn't pointed out uh, specifically in the publication, but what we learned and the way we came to understanding how we could use spherical aberration to correct presbyopia was because we had started with patients who had toxic levels of spherical aberration in their eyes. We, this is in the early 2000s, our goal was to try and repair night vision in these patients who had been damaged by spherical ablations in the 1990s. And I was using the MEL, the MEL 80 with this Waska aberrometer, huge resolution. We were gonna flatten the wavefront as, the, as some of the company marketing uh, um, brochures were telling us. And what I found was with it only slightly decreased the spherical aberration with this wavefront guided treatment. We only decreased the spherical aberration by about 25%. But what we learned was that with that modest decrease in spherical aberration, we were still correcting the patient's night vision and patients had a lot of depth of field. So we learned that the limit to which we can get depth of field increase was about one and a half diopters by spherical aberration on the cornea. Any more spherical aberration on the cornea leads to a loss of contrast and no increase in depth of field. So having one and a half diopters of depth of field, that is not enough for having, you know, excellent near vision. And so that is where I used a little bit of anisometropia to be able to cover the field from near through intermediate through distance. And because both eyes are seeing approximately the same in the intermediate zone, this becomes a Panem's fusion zone, for example, uh, you know, if you like, and the brain just has binocular fusion. So the dominant eye, although it's set to Plano, that Plano is in the middle of one and a half diopters of depth of field. So the, so the near end of that depth of field is at minus 0.75. So at near, the distance eye sees as if it was minus 0.75. And the, the near eye, the non-dominant eye, which is nominally set to minus 150, that minus, that's one and a half diopters depth of field means that at distance, the eye sees as if it was 2060 minus 0.75, but at near, it sees as if it was minus 225. That's the one and a half diopter range around the minus 150. So you can see that there's a very big overlap in the intermediate and into the intermediate overlap is what leads us to be able to fuse. So all of this came from this paper, which we published in 2005. It's work that we did in 2004 and presented at the meetings where we were looking at night vision disturbances and spherical aberration. And we defined a parameter to calibrate, if you like, um, the change in night vision disturbances using spherical aberration as a measure. So I developed a software algorithm that essentially what it does, um, it prevents the 
spherical aberration of the eye going above the threshold which we determined in that study of plus 0.6 or minus 0.6 meaning that the nascent eye that arrives with a little bit of spherical aberration, positive spherical aberration, if you were to treat a minus a high myopia, for example, you might have pushed the spherical aberration above this threshold, caused night vision disturbances in low contrast. But what the software does is that it injects an antidote to the increase in spherical aberration and therefore diminishes the increase in spherical aberration, keeping it within this threshold region so that we get the therapeutic benefits of spherical aberration and not the toxic levels. In a hyperopic eye, equally comes in with a little bit of positive spherical aberration and the ablation makes the spherical aberration go into the negative. So again, keeping it within the minus 0.6 range. And the plano presbyope, who might have a little spherical aberration in each eye, would have possibly a little increase in the spherical aberration just to give it more depth of field in that distance eye and a drive into the negative for the near eye. So again, driving the eye into the therapeutic range of spherical aberration so that there is increased depth of field so that the anisometropia between the eyes becomes a binocular process um, and it's not monovision and the tolerance goes up. So all of these challenges that monovision presents are improved upon by using spherical aberration in this way. And so Presbyond, as I've said, is a modified binocular vision solution. And we need to compare that to what Graham Barrett was talking about, which was modest monovision, where you're losing near vision to get better intermediate and playing you know, with that anisometropia to get uh, the balance that the patient may wish to have. It's a binocular process, but presbyon versus monovision, which is a uh, monocular process. Now, I will show you later that Graham Barrett has now added spherical aberration to an IOL, which is made by Rayner. And so he's now doing modified binocular vision presbyon with IOLs. So this difference between the eyes in monovision is only tolerated, as I said, by about two thirds of patients. But because the distance vision of the near eye and the near vision of the distance eye is slightly better when we add spherical aberration and both eyes see pretty much the same at the intermediate level that is why virtually all patients or all people will tolerate blended vision in our first paper on this in 2009 on hyperopia up to plus six we demonstrated that of the patients that we screened for this procedure, 97% tolerated this microinosometropia. And we called this laser blended vision at the time uh, before Zeiss programmed it into their laser and, uh, and uh, commercially called it Presbyond. So let's look at this neural summation uh, element. So out of our three publications with more than 100 patients, myopia up to minus 850, hyperopia up to plus six, and plano emetropes, uh, presbyopes, about 400 patients. If we look at the distance vision of the non-dominant eye, 80% of these patients had 2063 vision. And many eyes had better, of course. And we would expect a minus 150 refraction to actually have 2080 vision. So they had better distance vision than expected for the actual refraction that was targeted. In the meantime, the distance dominant eyes we had 92% 2020, but when the patients were looking at distance binocularly, 96% had 2020. In other words, you know, overall, adding the 2060 eye to the 2020 eye gave you better vision. When we looked at stereoacuity in a subset of patients, myopes, hyperopes, and emetropes, and we measured their pre-op near best corrected stereo and post-op near best corrected stereo to see whether there had been loss of stereoacuity, but then looked at the post-op uncorrected stereo to see whether there was any stereoacuity left uncorrected with presbyon in place. We were very surprised to find that 100% of the patients had 400 seconds of stereo uncorrected, and two-thirds of the patients had 100 seconds or more. So, Presbyond 
this microinosomotropia with increased depth of field by spheric elaboration results in maintaining stereoacuity uncorrected. How is Presbyon performed? Well, you have to know how to do the pre-op testing and the standard operating procedure refraction test and the plus 150, it's being called the Reinstein plus 150 test to, um, to determine the candidacy and exclude those 3% who aren't candidates. But essentially the procedure is the same as LASIK. So the process with the patient, once we have determined that there's, they're a candidate, is to go through the description of the blending process and do all of the counseling so that they understand the three phases of recovery. Um, and, you know, see, in the, the immediate post-op day, it's basically LASIK recovery, slight discomfort, but a dry eye, halos around the lights at night. And the next morning, everything's healed. We then tell them that over the next few weeks, the vision's gonna fluctuate, the night vision's not gonna be that good or whatever. And that over the next three, four, five, six months, that's where the brain is going to get this, um, this, this, this um, uh, conflict stage, as Dan Dury calls it, where, where the eyes are kind of fighting a little bit. That conflict produces neural, neural adaptation. There's a, there are new pathways that develop in order to join these two slightly disparate images between the eyes. And most patients, two thirds of the patients are adapted by three months, even in the plano presbyopic group. So LASIK, well, LASIK is a widely performed procedure. There've been you know, over 40 million or 50 million procedures around the world. We teach LASIK twice a year in our, in our forefront refractive surgery course. We teach it as a 75 step granular procedure so that we can standardize every process and increase safety. We demonstrate that uh, fellowship trained surgeons can perform at the same level of safety as expert surgeons. We go through everything in a highly granular fashion, a, you know, highly detailed description of exactly what is required to make flawless flap creation and flap replacement technique, how to avoid microfolds, how to manage microfolds if they occur. And then, of course, the post-op of Presbyond is the same as LASIK. It's basically you have your, your post-op visits um, and some patients might need a few additional if they're, uh, visits if they're struggling. They might need a pair of balance glasses if they're struggling with the difference between the eyes. Well, one of the great advantages of Presbyond over multifocality is that if the patient is struggling with adaptation, they can instantly reverse that discomfort with a pair of glasses, which diminishes the anamosomotropia or even reverses it completely. Whereas if you, if you have multifocality in the eye, uh, there's no pair of glasses or there's nothing that you can do really to alleviate the discomfort uh, during that neural adaptation process. Um, the post-op medications and process is exactly the same as LASIK. And the results are as good as LASIK, which is why it is more accurate than intraocular surgery. There's no intraocular formulas, there's no lens formulas that can enable us to get this level of accuracy um, with intraocular surgery. Uh, LASIK has the benefit of being able to give 90, well, 98% of patients up to minus eight, 20, 20, J5, and 97% of Plano patients and 95% of hyperopic patients up to plus six. So it's, we're taking advantage of this ready-made, beautiful, worldwide recognized procedure called LASIK and just using clever spherical aberration modulation to be able to get a presbyopic treatment out of people. The intermediate vision, which is the problem with monovision, here is 238 patients for myopia up to minus 12. You see that 100, practically 100% 100 of the patients have font size 12 vision at intermediate, and the same with hyperopia up to plus six and over 300 patients here. Um, there is no loss of two lines because it's LASIK and because we've modulated the spherical aberration so that there's no loss of contrast. In fact, there's a slight increase in contrast. Uh, in these patients because they're not looking through spectacles while we're doing the contrast test anymore. Um, and it's not just London Vision Clinic and Dan Reinstein who's producing these outcomes. These outcomes are now being reproduced all around the world, uh, in Asia, South America, um, through you know the distribution channels for, from Zeiss producing this product. So when we consider the disadvantages of multifocality and monovision, and the fact that spherical aberration with a microanosometropia 
really doesn't have disadvantages other than the fact that the eyes are not exactly the same. And that disadvantage is the disadvantage which can be instantly reversed by a simple pair of spectacles or permanently reversed or adjusted by a simple LASIK enhancement. It is not surprising that Presbyond is becoming one of the most uh, sought after procedures. And not only that, it is not surprising that the intraocular lens companies are starting to copy the principles as Presbyond. Yes, they're calling it different things, but actually they're copying the concept of using spherical aberration to increase depth of field. And, you know, the idea is to put all the science and clinical uh, pathways that we developed around Presbyond, uh, adapt it uh, with an IOL, and then you're basically doing presbyon with an intraocular lens. So, you know, the question of presbyopic correction on cornea or lens is very interesting because let's look at, for example, here the German census, and let's consider the presbyopic uh, population, and let's exclude the cataract population from this because that's cataract surgery. Um, in the UK, uh, we only have about 30% of people that get to cataract surgery. But if you're going to do cataract surgery and you want to introduce a multifocal IOL, the patient isn't going to notice any loss because they have low transmission to start with. And you're going to increase that transmission to 85% with your modern trifocal IOL. So they're going to be very, very happy. You've given them way better vision better, and you've given them three distances and they don't have to wear glasses. But if you take someone who has 97% transmission, who's a 52 year old plus two, and you put in a trifocal lens, you will be decreasing their transmission. And this, you know, in some patients leads to symptoms that don't resolve. So the fact that we are considering these two groups of patients, the cataract patients and the clear lens patients as the same and giving them the same treatment of a trifocal lens, um, you know, I think it needs examining because while only 30% of patients are going to get to cataract, um, the other 70% won't need the cataract surgery. So there's no excuse for doing the lens surgery early by saying that the advantage is that you won't need cataract surgery. I'm aware that, of course, in Asia, you know, in Nepal, the cataracts are much more frequent and occur at a much younger age. But I'm talking about Northern Europe here um, in, the, in this context. So let's leave away the 60 to 70 year old um, um, age group and let's focus on these people who have clear lenses, these 40 to 60 year olds. And remember, as I said, only 30 percent of them are going to need cataract surgery. But let me add to that one in six of these patients even if they have a clear OCT at the time of the clear lens exchange, one in six of them will develop macular degeneration. That's what happens in, in, our, in our societies here in Europe. Once you've decreased the contrast through multifocality in that eye, you're gonna put that patient at a disadvantage. One out of six patients could end up with a disadvantage. And so popping this multifocal or, 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 or let's say that the modern day technology into clear lenses of younger patients, this is their solution for life. And so in 20 or 30 years, if we had something better, an actual accommodative lens or, you know, with zero PCO rate that could be injected into a bag through a small incision, facorizats or something, they can't benefit from this technology anymore because they now have their permanent lens replacement. And that is, of course, I'm going to have to pay lip service here, but because serious complications of intraocular surgery are, are unusual, but they're not impossible. And so anybody who's had a clear lens exchange that ends up with one of these nasty complications with serious visual loss, it, you know, the question is going to be begged as to whether they should have had a, a corneal presbyon procedure instead that would have avoided this situation. And I, I, from a medical legal standpoint, if the patient would have been a candidate for both procedures and they weren't consented for both procedures, or at least weren't told about both procedures, this could be a problem. Let's fo focus in on the biggest problem with clear lens exchange, particularly in myopic eyes. Uh, the vitreous of the young is different from the old. And this means that the rate of retinal detachment um, decreases the older the patient is when they have their 
phaco emulsification. So in this 65,000 eye study from New Zealand, um, there was about, almost a 20 times increase in retinal detachment surgery over a five year period um, if cataract surgery was performed. In the French study with 2.6 million eyes, the overall risk was 1% at four years, which is way higher than in the general population. And you know you can see here from the graph that if you did the cataract surgery in someone in their late 60s, they have a third of the chance of developing a retinal attachment than if you do it in this popular clear lens exchange population of uh, people in their, you know, from 45 to 55. The other thing about permanent lens replacement, as it's advertised and, and talked about to the public, is that it implies that the vision is permanent. And, you know, we know from large scale studies, if we just look at, there's no long term studies on permanent lens replacement. So there's very little publications um, in the literature on permanent lens replacement in the long term. But if we look at corneal uh, uh, astigmatism, we know that corneal astigmatism is very stable about up until about the age of 40. And if you do a clear lens exchange at that point, you're actually going to be doing this right at the time when corneal astigmatism is starting to change. And how much does it change by? Well, there's a very large study here showing that over the five years, about one third of eyes are going to change by more than a diopter of astigmatism. And we all know that a diopter of astigmatism with a multifocal IOL makes it not work. So permanent lens replacement is not permanent vision correction. And how would you adjust the vision back once the vision is changed after the permanent lens replacement? By a laser enhancement. So why not start with laser and do a laser enhancement in five years anyway? So how do you decide between cornea and lens? Well, the way we decide between cornea and lens is by looking at the transparency of the lens. Now, the HD analyzer, which is a phenomenal technology, the Tracy does the similar sort of stuff. It looks at the optics of the whole eye. So yeah, the tear film and you know haze in the cornea, scarring, basement membrane dystrophy, higher order vibrations in the cornea, they can affect the um, ocular scatter index. Um, but it's really a, a good measure of lens changes. And, you know, if you have a low ocular scatter, you'll have a transparent lens. And so, you know, there's an objective way of measuring lens transparency. And that is a very quick and easy way for us to determine if a patient, although being older, may still be a candidate for corneal surgery. So you, as you can see, we have many, many presbyon patients even up into the 70s and 80s, who had very good lens transmission. This would have been my father. He was um, 74 here um, and had completely transparent lenses. He's only needed cataract surgery now that he's 86. In fact, he's having the second eye done. He's 89 uh, in a month's time. Whereas, of course, patients who have high OSIs, they go to cataract surgery. So what are the trends? Well, the most common presbyopic procedure offered to patients, as you all know, it is clear lens exchange. That is the most commonly performed procedure for, for presbyopes. And monovision LASIK is thought to be not, you can't do LASIK in older patients. You're going to get dry eye. You can't do LASIK in older patients. There's a lot of folklore around that. And we need to understand how this happens. And it happens through a sort of social engineering through the way our industry advertises. Because one of the things is that in the early 2000s, FACO machines became way better. All the computerized fluoretics meant that FACO was safer. And so the confidence of FACO surgeons went up and the ability to, you know, get into a cataract surgery with a much better level of vision, you know, started to grow. But one of the good things that the lens community did is that they, they always underpromised with what they were going to achieve and over delivered. So yeah, you're going to need glasses for reading. And then when 50% of the people don't need glasses for reading, they're really, really happy. On the other hand, one of the things that the multifocal corneal procedures that, you know, were all over the place was lots of iterations for multifocal corneal. What the mistakes that they made was because they were coming from the LASIK side, they were over promising and then under delivering. So that kind of hurt, you know, these multifocal corneas, they weren't working well. And so, you know, that gave cornea a bad reputation and people were still pushed back to lens. 
And of course, the meetings are sponsored mainly by lens manufacturers. So, you know, most of the talks, most of the uh, airtime is spent talking about clear lens exchange and issues around that and multifocality. So there's been a lot of social engineering around that, and that's led to a huge preference in recommending lens exchange to patients rather than corneal surgery. But what's interesting is to look at what is the most common presbyopic procedure chosen by surgeons for their own eyes. And we know that until now, monovision has been the most common surgical procedure that surgeons have chosen for their own eyes. And since we started teaching our forefront refractive surgery course uh, back in 2016, uh, we're doing, in fact, our course as this, as this course is taking place, um, and it's available online uh, on demand after we give the course this, this week, and it'll be a, our next uh, session will be in November. But the very first course we did, a colleague of mine uh, asked me if he would have, because he had seen me at ACOS presenting on this, and he said, well, can I come and get presbyon? I'm a plano presbyop. And I said, well, why don't we do your surgery the week of the course, and then you can stay in London and give a talk about your decision process and about how you decided to have presbyon and what, how it felt like and what your experience was. So he, he very kindly came and we, we did the surgery and he presented his results of his own eyes the next day. And in the audience was another surgeon who then asked me the same thing and so on and so on and so on and so on. We know of over 20 surgeons now that have had, well, most of them have had surgery by us and, and several that have had surgery around the world now. Um, those are the ones we know about. And this is surgeons choosing presbyond in their eyes I think for obvious reasons, you've looked at the logistics and the logic of how this procedure is constructed, and you can understand why, you know, maintaining stereoacuity, no loss of contrast, adjustability, reversibility, um, it's, it's an, and, you know, taking advantage of a very quick recovery that LASIK affords. And so it's the procedure that I certainly chose for my own eyes. And um, rather than wearing, I never bought a pair of reading glasses. I just literally just had surgery. So I went from having presbyopic vision to having um, perfect vision. My, I'm Plano, Plano in minus 175. In my one, minus 175 eye, I see 2050 at distance. That's a massive depth of field, 2010. Binocularly, I'm 2010. I have J3 intermediate vision and J1 at near. And my near point is about there. I can see my fingerprint at this distance. My contrast sensitivity is still high, very high normal. I have 40 seconds of uncorrected stereo. And, you know, my vision is the same as it was when I was 20 years old playing the saxophone at Club Med in Tunisia. Um, although, of course, I don't look like I did back then, but I do see as well as I did back then. So when we think about what surgeons select for their own eyes, and there are very few surgeons who have had clear lens exchange with a multifocal. That's for sure. There are surgeons who've had monovision, but not multifocals in their eyes. Very few. I know because I've been monitoring this for the last few years. So when we understand this and we understand all of the benefits of extended depth of field by spherical aberration, the ability to correct pure presbyopia with no refractive error, the ability to correct presbyopia with a refractive error from plus five to minus nine using a natural spherical aberration aberration which is naturally occurring in the eye being able to accurately correct the cylinder at the same time being able to easily enhance this re re result in the future if the eye shifts being able to center the treatment on the visual axis with an eye tracker being able to you know uh, be, be, being the fact that it's tolerated by more than 95% of the patients that walk through your door and the fact that it's produced in a, as a 10 minute procedure that heals in a few hours, patients reading the menu that night uh, without glasses with their husband or their wife, and they come in the next day to book in for you. So I don't think it's a surprise that multifocality and monovision are on the down and extended depth of field with spherical aberration either by cornea or by IOLs, is on the up. And the fact that corneal surgery is lower risk than lens surgery, you know, by default, uh, explains why with clear lenses, more people are opting for corneal presbyond or laser blended vision um, uh, as time goes on. And this is becoming, I think, the new standard of care. So thank you very much for your attention.